Of Not Betty by Christopher Paul Curtis, Chapter 12, Part 2. Wrote in Lefty Lewis's boring stories about the railroad and the union and baseball. I was out cold in no time. When I woke up, I looked out the window and stretched. Lefty Lewis said, I was about to take you to Butterworth Hospital. I thought you'd left the earth for good. He pointed out of the window and said, looking familiar, uh-oh. Yes, sir. I pointed at a gasoline filling station and said, yep, there's the gasoline filling station, he said. I guess your daddy would have to burn premium in that big Packard, wouldn't he? I don't think those big engines can run on ethyl gasoline. I said, no, sir, that's right. He told me, well, you and your daddy sure have one beautiful machine. I was getting real nervous, but I said, thank you, sir. We turned another corner, and my heart started jumping around in my stomach. Halfway down the street was a building that looked like it was made out of giant chopped-down trees. The log cabin. Uh-oh. Right outside the place was a sign that said, Appearing Friday through Sunday in July, Herman E. Calloway and the New Blend Knights of the New Deal. My father had joined a new band. Lefty Lewis pulled up next to a car that was as long as a big boat. He said, Ah, there's the Packard. He's here. I had to think real fast. I couldn't let Mr. Lewis and Hermione e. Calloway talk to each other. If they did, I'd be on the first thing smoking back to Flint. And besides, I felt kind of bad about lying to Mr. Lewis. I wish I didn't have to. Lefty Lewis cut the car off and pulled the key out of the dashboard. I said, Mr. Lewis, this is going to be very embarrassing for me. What is, bud? Can I talk to my father by myself, sir? I swear I'll turn myself into him. Lefty Lewis looked at me kind of hard. Well, bud, I don't mean to sully your reputation, but you just ran away from that man all the way across the state. I think I'd better hand deliver you. But Mr. Lewis, sir, I need to explain it to him by myself. I promise I'll go in and not run away again. Lefty Lewis looked out the windshield like he was thinking. He reached back across the seat and put his hand on the twine, keeping my suitcase together. He said, I'll tell you what, bud. You don't go anywhere without this, do you? I said, no, sir. Okay, here's the deal I'll give you. He looked at his wristwatch. Five minutes to talk to your dad alone. If you're not back by then, I'll bring your bag in for you. It wasn't great, but it would have to do. Besides, it gave me some more time to think. Please promise that you won't look inside of it, sir. He raised his hand. You've got my word. I got out of the car and walked to the front of the log cabin. The doors looked like they were made out of chopped down trees, just like the rest of the building. I looked back at Lefty Lewis, and he was still watching, so I opened one of the doors. I knew it was one of those doors that Mama had been talking about. I walked in to see what was going to happen. Shucks! There was another set of regular doors inside. The front door closed behind me, and I was in the dark. I tried the other door, and it came open, but I didn't push it all the way in. I waited, then went back out to get my bag. I walked over to the driver's side of Lefty Lewis's car, smiled, and said, Thank you very much, sir. He's in there. He was so glad to see me that I'm not even in a whole lot of trouble. He's real busy right now, and told me to tell you thank you very much, and that he'd get a hold of you. Lefty Lewis smiled, too. Well, he might be happy now, but if I know anything about your daddy, I expect you're going to be having problems sitting down before the night's over. Now, I know he's going to tell you this, but i got to add my two cents. Son, there just aren't too many places a young Negro boy should be traveling by himself, especially not clear across Michigan. There's folks in this state that make your average Ku Kluxer look like John Brown. You know who John Brown is? Uh-oh. No, sir. That's all right. He's out there moldering somewhere. But the point is, you were very lucky this time. You've got to be good and stay put. I know your dad's not the easiest man in the world, but believe me, he's mellowed a lot from when it was just him and your sister. The next time you're of a mind to do a little traveling, you come on down to the train station and ask for Lefty Lewis first. I won't tell anyone, but we need to talk before you set out on your own again. Lefty Lewis. Think you can remember that name? Lefty Lewis. Well, at least he was using the alias all over, and not just with me and his family in Flint. He handed my bag out of the window. 
Okay, get back on in there and tell your daddy I said hello. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I stood waving until the big car turned out into the street. I slept in a jumbo gulp of air and opened the front door again. This time I pushed the second set of doors open and walked in. It was dark, but I could see that there were six men sitting in a circle on a little stage at the other end of the room. One of them was white. Five of the men had their eyes on the other guy. One of them had drumsticks in his hand and was leaned over softly, tapping out a rhythm on the wooden stage floor. Three of them were drinking from bottles of pop, and one, a real old one, was using a rag to wipe the inside of a trumpet. The guy who had to be my father was sitting with his back to me, wearing a hat. He was talking just like me, and it didn't take much listening to tell he was lying, or at least doing some real good exaggerating, just like I do. That was all the proof I needed. His voice was a lot rougher and more tired sounding than I thought it would be. He leaned back in his chair. That's right. After I won the Golden Gloves, no one couldn't tell me I wasn't going to be middleweight champ within two, three years tops. The drummer stopped tapping. Middleweight? What, this was so long ago gravity wasn't as strong as it is now? Or did a pound just weigh less back then? The others laughed, but my dad didn't let it bother him. That's right, middleweight. You gotta keep in mind that I had more hair and a fewer pounds back then. Pulled the hat off and rubbed his hands over his glass-smoothed head. My dad shaved his hair. That was something I always wanted to do, too. He said, My manager goes and lines up about against a fighter out of Chicago by the name of Jordan Snaggletooth McNevin. From the name, I'm expecting some young Irish kid with bad teeth, but this guy was one of us, and so old that he could have been a waiter at the Last Supper. When the fight began, I wasn't about to show mercy, you understand? All the guys on stage were nodding. And to make a long story longer, I go out and flip this halfway stiff right jab clean at Pop's head and... The horn guy said, Herman, to this day, I can't believe you swung at that old man. What was I supposed to do, Jimmy? I wasn't trying to kill him or nothing. I just wanted to put him down quick and quiet. Jimmy went, uh, uh, uh. And the next thing I know, I'm watching my mouthpiece and my chance to be a champ flying out of the ring into the fourth row of seats. I ain't never been hit so hard in my life, the drummer said. What? You lost one fight and quit? Then Herman E. Calloway said the words that let me know I was right. I felt like someone had cut a light on inside me. I knew it had been right for me to come all the way from Flint to Grand Rapids to find my dad. The idea that had started as a teeny-weeny seed in a suitcase was now a mighty maple. Herman E. Calloway, my father, said, There comes a time when you're doing something and you realize it just doesn't make any sense to keep on doing it. You ain't being a quitter. It's just that the good Lord has seen fit to give you the sense to know you understand enough is enough. That was the exact same thought I'd had when I got whipped by Toddy Boy. Only two folks with me, the same blood, would think them just alike. I sucked in a big gulp of air, got a good grip on my suitcase, and walked into the light of the stage. The old horn guy, Jimmy, saw me first and said, I thought I heard that door open. Did Miss Thomas send you, son? I just kept walking onto the stage. I had to see my father's face. I knew we'd look so much alike that the truth would hit him as hard as that snaggletooth guy had. Even Lefty Lewis said he could tell me and Herman E. Calloway were kin. He turned to see who Jimmy was talking to, and my mighty maple started shaking in the wind. My dad's face was old. My dad's face was real old, just like this horn guy. Maybe too old. But there was just too much proof that this was my father. He smiled at me. He had his arm crossed over a great big stomach with his head wiping rag hanging out of his right hand. The first thing my dad said to me was, Well, 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 little man, what brings you here? Miss Thomas? I don't know any Miss Thomas, sir. So what are you doing here? He put his hand over my eyes to shield them from the stage lights and looked out into the dark part of the bar. I noticed how wrinkly my dad's hand was. Who brought you here? Your folks out there? No, sir. I'm here to meet my father, Jimmy said. Who's your daddy? Why'd he tell you to meet him here? 
I kept looking at Herman E. Calloway. He didn't tell me to meet him here, sir. I come all the way from Flint to meet my daddy for the very first time. All the men looked over at the drummer. He stopped tapping. He said, Aw, oh, man, look, this child ain't no kin of mine. What's your mama's name, boy? I said, You ain't my daddy. I pointed right at Hermony e. Calloway's big belly. You know it's you. All the eyes jumped over on Hermony e. Calloway. He quit smiling and looked at me a lot harder, like he was really noticing me. I knew if I was a regular kid, I'd be crying buckets of tears now. I didn't want these men to think I was a baby, so I was real glad that my eyes don't cry no more. My nose plugged up and a little growl came out of my mouth, but I kept my finger pointed, cleared my throat, and said, I know it's you.